Welcome everyone to the technical assistance section session for the Clean Energy Contractor Incubator Program. This is our technical assistance session. This program is supported by the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. We hope that this information will encourage you to apply and provide some best practices and tools to be successful in your application. Before I begin, I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping. The Bidders Conference is recorded. If you have any questions, please put your questions in the chat. If we're unable to get to your question during the webinar, it, can be, it will be included in an online FAQ. We will send out the recording and the slide deck after the webinar and the slides and presentation will be posted on the Notice of Funding Opportunities website at the link that will be posted in the chat here. Please make sure that you registered for this conference with your email address. Um, for example, if you're sitting in the room with other people watching it together, just know that the recording link from this conference will be sent to those who, um, who received the link for the meeting. Um, and that will only go to those who had registered for this conference. So if you're using someone else's credentials today or watching the webinar with others, um, that link isn't gonna come directly to you. So go ahead and register for the conference in the chat um, at the link that is also provided in the chat. So my name is Stacy Glass. I work with the University of Illinois. Um, I'm a CJA Implementation Technical Assistance Provider. I'm joined here today by Erica White. She is the State Director of the Illinois Small Business Development Center Network at the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. Um, as part of the presentation this afternoon, we will also have Amber Broughton from DCEO uh, go over a GATA training with everybody, um, which is uh, DCEO's initial, um, like the initial work that needs to be done to sign up to be eligible to be a, um, a provider in their programs. We may have some of the CJA regional administrators on the call as well. We plan on covering many topics today. We're going to cover and introduce the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act and then move into details about this grant opportunity. We'll discuss funding information, eligibility, and details about proposal submission for this grant. Afterwards, I'll hand it to Amber to, prevent, to present on the Grant Accountability and Transparency Act, or GATA. If there's time at the end of the meeting, we will open it up for Q&A at the end. Please note this session is being recorded and the recording is going to be made available on the Clean Energy Contractor Incubator Program website after this meeting. Here are just a few Zoom basics. Throughout the webinar, please keep your microphone on mute to minimize disruptions to the presentation. Um, you can keep your video on or off during the presentation as you like. At the end, uh, we may go into Q&A where the audience can ask questions out loud to the presenters. Um, before speaking, if you can use the raise your hand function, you will be called on by a facilitator. You may put questions in the chat at any time, and these will be answered by one of the program specialists or directors who are on the call listening in. If the question isn't answered in the chat today, your question will be recorded and answered in the Q&A document linked to the NOFO website. There are a lot of um, Q&A for this program, uh, questions and answers that have already been answered. Um, as part of the program, it is a NOFO that has been opened previously before. So I would encourage anyone on the call to go back and to check on the Q&A uh, before submitting questions about the program. So let's get started with a discussion of the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act legislation. CEJA stands for the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, and this is comprehensive landmark energy legislation in Illinois that centers equity and puts Illinois on track to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2050. You can see in the pie chart that it encompasses a lot of different aspects of workforce development and business development. We'll be talking about these today, and I also want to emphasize that there is so much more to this legislation. It includes energy access and solar for all. 
It includes renewable energy components, energy efficiency components, and how we're going to get to carbon-free power as a state. This includes funding for electric transportation and support for fossil fuel workers and their families who are displaced by closing fossil fuel plants and the industry. As we move towards a 100% renewable energy future, we have to be mindful that um, historically, not all groups of people and communities have had access to new opportunities. And many have been disproportionately impacted by environmental changes and community disinvestment. One of the goals of CJA is to ensure that the benefits of clean energy investments and good paying clean energy jobs are distributed equitably across the state. And workforce development fits into the largest, larger CJA initiative. Illinois is investing in clean energy sources, um, electric vehicles, and energy efficiency. And to go along with that, we need to expand the clean energy workforce in order to do that work. One of the goals of CJA is to ensure that the benefits of clean energy investments and good paying clean energy jobs are distributed equitably. So how do we define equity? Equity gets everyone the support they need and justice removes barriers. This is in contrast with equality where we see that everyone receives the same supports. However, what we know to be true is that not everyone starts at the same point. In the image um, on the screen, uh, in the image on the left of the screen, equality does not account for the height of each individual trying to enjoy the game. As a result, even though um, each person then receives the same support um, in the, oh yeah, in, in that part of the screen, even though everyone is receiving the same support, the same supports, someone is still left out of the game. Equity ensures that everyone receives the supports they need in order to participate. CJ is written with the equity activities that have the potential to yield justice outcomes meaning that systemic barriers have been removed and people can um, all enjoy kind of the same benefits of the program or the game in this case without supports and accommodation. CJA will benefit communities and groups of people within the state with a specific focus on the equity investment eligible communities which include both Restore, Reinvest, and Renew Communities, or R3 for short, and Environmental Justice Communities, which we might also just refer to in this presentation as EJ. An R3 community is one that has been harmed by violence, excessive incarceration, and economic disinvestment. An Environmental Justice Community is one where residents have historically been subject to disproportionate burdens of pollution. Here are two examples of eligible communities. These are various areas in Chicagoland and in Peoria in Illinois. The link found on this slide will take you to a map that shows you all of the equity investment eligible communities in Illinois. An array of programs have been developed or expanded under the CJA legislation, which spans multiple state agencies. On the screen are the workforce and contractor development programs that fall within the purview of DCEO and DCEO's offices. The expectation is that this ecosystem of programs will benefit communities and groups of people throughout the state with a specific focus on the R3 and EJ communities. On the top left are the workforce training and support programs for workers for clean energy jobs. On the right are the contractor business support programs, including this contractor incubator program, the Prime's contractor accelerator program, and the Jobs and Environmental Justice Grants program. Uh, the last one, the Jobs and Environmental Justice Grants program encompasses two programs that are designed to provide upfront capital to support the development of projects, businesses, community organizations, and jobs that are creating opportunities for disadvantaged populations. Their subprograms include the Equity Energy Futures Grant and the Community Solar Sovereignty Grant. All of these programs really do need to work together to, uh, to engage employers, engage contractors and industry leaders, 
and union apprenticeships to facilitate job placement and facilitate work-based learning opportunities. The workforce programs can't exist with strong partnerships and employers. The contractor support programs can't exist without well-trained staff. The equity-focused contractor support programs are designed and meant to help contractors expand their capacity to do clean energy projects that are funded by CJA and other legislation. The contractor incubator and the PRIMES contractor accelerators will help the clean energy contractors receive resources they need to support business growth and implement renewable energy and energy efficiency projects in our state. The programs will help contractor businesses identify and bid on the kinds of clean energy projects that get Illinois to 100% renewable energy by 2050. And in the last slide of this section, we're going to just review what CJA considers a clean energy business or nonprofit. The clean energy businesses or nonprofits are involved in the manufacture, development, building, installation, maintenance or provide ancillary services in the industries represented on this slide. Clean energy businesses may also be providing administrative sales and other support functions to these industries as well. Okay, in the next section, we're going to go ahead and cover the program requirements for the contractor incubator program. The primary goal of the Clean Energy Contractor Incubator Program is to equitably grow the clean energy workforce to meet the demand for clean energy technology and services. This Clean Energy Contractor Program will increase business opportunities for clean energy contractors and nonprofits and help contractor businesses grow so that they can be able to take advantage of opportunities in the clean energy sector. These programs are being delivered in 13 regional workforce sites in their surrounding areas. Currently under this NOFO, applications are being accepted for the program in the regions that are in bold on this slide. These include Waukegan, Champaign, Danville, Carbondale, East St. Louis, and Alton. The contractor incubator programs are designed to serve contractor businesses and nonprofits in disadvantaged areas. The selection criteria for which entities that are prioritized for entry into the contractor incubator program include people who are displaced energy workers and people who experience barriers to employment and people who reside in environmental justice and or are three communities in Illinois. So when the contractor incubators are recruiting for participants in their programs, they do need to pay attention to the demographics of the people that are joining their program, as well as keep track of whether or not their participants either reside in one of the EJ or R3 communities or are in both. That's gonna be important for metrics. Applicants uh, that apply to run one of the contractor incubator programs in Illinois are going to need to demonstrate in their applications, their experience with and plans for carrying out these tasks. Recruiting participants, providing contractors access to low cost capital, um, which includes just providing access on like the options of where to get capital, providing business and financial services support, providing training and mentorship supports, connecting contractors to training, assisting with certifications, and also helping to match contractors to opportunities and beneficial collaborations that are gonna help grow their business or bring them business. I'm gonna go over each of these support tasks one by one in the following slides. The contractor incubator programs are tasked with identifying participants who have existing businesses or are starting new businesses to participate in the contractor incubator program. Recruitment will include engaging in activities that are proactive, inclusive, and equitable. 
um, it is important to go where the people are. A successful program will be successful at recruiting uh, the people for the program that meet the criteria that we went over in previous slides. The incubators can provide outreach through entities that hire contractors or programs that provide clean energy related projects. It can be helpful to identify existing organizations in your region that are already likely to work with eligible contractors. And these might include a local workforce innovation board or a small business development center and others to connect with and provide information about this program. The contractor incubators will need to be familiar with and be prepared to help contractors identify and access low cost capital for um, operations in their projects. The institutions listed on this slide are some examples of the organizations that the contractor incubator will help the contractor participating contractors have access to. The Equity Energy Future Grant Program on this slide, for example, through CJA, is currently accepting applications for projects on a rolling basis. So this is one to connect participating contractors to. Support for business and financial services includes providing services that help contractors achieve um, kind of this list of the following. Again, this is not kind of meant to be an exhaustive list, here are some examples, and these are the examples that are called out in the NOFO itself. So achieving financial assurance, improving back office services, helping to obtain insurance and permits, accessing training relevant to their business, which should be tailored to the participants um, that are participating in the program, gaining certifications, um, obtaining assistance with business planning, and uh, locating options for low interest loans. In terms of training and mentorship and support, the kinds of activities that the contractor incubator will deliver will be designed to help contractors with the elements listed in this slide. The contractor incubator should be prepared to help connect contractors with clean energy projects, help them register as approved vendors, develop partnering and networking skills and help contractors work as subcontractors on larger projects. The contractor incubator can help their participants compete for capital and resources, execute clean energy projects and connect to the Department of Labor for prevailing wage compliance. Again, these are um, examples, but not an exhaustive list. And when you're applying for the program, it will be important for you to share your experience and plans for helping the uh, participants in your program achieve this, um, achieve these kind of things here. Now, if you've attended one or more of the CJA technical assistance sessions, you will certainly have heard before that coordination with other CJA programs is a major key to success. The contractor incubators will need to demonstrate how to coordinate, how they will coordinate with other CJA workforce programs, including the Clean Energy Primes Accelerator Program, Small Business Development Centers, and APEX Accelerators, as well as clean energy programs and more in order to share information, coordinate activities, and equitably serve the participating contractors that are in the Contractor Incubator Program. We want to talk a little bit more about equity. The CJA contractor incubator programs must incorporate core equity values, which include diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility. And here I'm going to review the definition for each. Diversity is the representation of people from a variety of backgrounds and experiences. Inclusion is the action or state of including and feeling as an empowered sense of belonging within a group or organization. Accessibility, according to the Office of Civil Rights from the U.S. Department of Education, um, is when a person with a disability is afforded the opportunity to acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services as a person without a disability in an equally integrated and equally effective manner with substantially equivalent ease of use. 
The Office of Equity extends accessibility beyond disability to include the creation of financially, technology, technologically, and linguistically accessible systems, resources, and services so that all can thrive in a society. Each of these three foundational elements contribute to equity, which is the state quality or ideal of being just, impartial, and fair. Equity must be structural and systemic and comprised of a robust infrastructure and dynamic process that produces equitable ideas, power, and resources. In your applications to the Contractor Incubator Program, we want to see how your outreach and recruitment strategies will be equitable. How will the training you provide help to remove barriers to business obstacles faced by businesses rooted in the equity eligible communities? Are you connecting with diverse stakeholders and developing relationships with equity, equity eligible populations? The contractor development programs are equity focused, and this goes beyond who they are serving and the numeric participant targets for these programs. We expect the contractor incubator program to work to eliminate and reduce barriers to business success by offering training and services. Programs should build a community of collaboration among participant businesses and empower them for resilience and success. Programs will set goals and measure outcomes and then adjust the programs as needed to make sure that the equity goals are being met. And finally, we hope that grantees will create a culture of belonging that celebrates differences. Here are some ways in which the contractor incubator program can help an energy contractor business. So the challenges can be examples of a lack of upfront capital for clean energy projects. What the energy, con um, what the contractor incubator can do is provide technical assistance to apply for the Equity Energy Future Grant or other low cost capital grants. If the participant business, if the participant business is having difficulty managing some aspect of their business operations, then the contractor incubator can provide connection to back office services or staffing grants. For companies or contractors that do not have a long-term plan for growth, the contractor incubator should be providing assistance with business planning and mentorship to help the contractor business achieve a long-term plan. If there's lack of knowledge about insurance and permitting requirements, the contractor incubator can hold training events or provide individual technical assistance. Sometimes contractors may have difficulty competing on clean energy related project installations just due to their lack of size and um, uh, you know, lack of number of employees that could work on a project. So here's where the contractor incubator program can help facilitate partnering and networking events that help facilitate subcontracts on projects so that newer contractors or smaller contractors can serve in a subcontracting capacity and still uh, participate in an opportunity. If, there are lack of, if there's a lack of awareness of a clean energy project opportunity, um, one of the ways that the contractor incubator program would help would be providing assistance to have the contractor, participating contractor, register as an approved vendor, provide webinars on funding and other opportunities. Um, and lastly, if a contractor has difficulty navigating compliance standards or any of the reporting requirements, the contractor incubator can provide technical support and training to assist. And in fact, with this program, there is a lot of data collection and reporting required. So the contractor incubator program must be prepared to provide reports to DCEO that include all of the information on this slide. The contractor incubator will collect and report on the number of participating contractors, demographic data of participants, um, as well as the certifications held by participants. The incubator program must track the number of projects that participating contractors um, have 
So the contractors will need to be reporting back to the incubator on meeting their goals. The program will collect information about contractor business revenue and hiring metrics, as well as other indicators to assess the financial health of participant contractors. Linking this back to the previous slide where we talk about navigation with compliance or reporting requirements, again, there may be more reporting requirements that the contractors need to report on just in terms of carrying out their business, but they may even need support. They may not have they may never have had to report back to a program like a contractor incubator um, in terms of their uh, in terms of their business statistics that need to come back to the incubator. So they'll need some help and assistance in being able to do so. So that information can be provided back to DCEO. The contractor incubator also needs to report on their own training activities and any sessions, including the number of sessions held and the number of participants who attend each. The impacts will need to be measurable. Here are some of the metrics that tell a story of how the contractor incubator programs will have success. DCEO will measure the number of contracts secured, partnerships, changes in business revenue in the uh, participating contractor businesses in the program, number of jobs retained and created through their participation, uh, all of the bids and proposals submitted, new certifications obtained in the field and more. Next, we'll go over funding information and eligibility to the program. The total award is $21 million per year and the range of the award will be 500,000 to 2.5 million. There will be at least one award in each of the 13 hub locations. And the application is for one year of funding and up to two 12 month renewals uh, may be rewarded based on grantee performance. So who can apply to run the contractor incubator programs? Community-based organizations, including nonprofits, accredited public colleges and universities can apply to be the location of the contractor incubator service. The applicant should have a history of providing business-related assistance and knowledge to help entrepreneurs start, run, and grow their businesses. The applicant will demonstrate knowledge of construction and clean energy trades. Through the applications, relationships with local resident and organizations serving equity eligible communities and program eligible populations within the service area should be demonstrated. The applicant should show their ability to effectively recruit and serve diverse and underrepresented populations in the program delivery area and facilities need to be ADA compliant. There needs to be a capacity for the program operations and training, preferably within equity, equity investment communities and as conveniently accessible as possible. Interested organizations may propose to deliver all of the required elements or can choose to subcontract some of the elements to other entities that have experience that meet the needs of the program. So it is possible for more experienced partners like SBDCs to apply and they can partner with less experienced partners on some of these areas, such as recruiting participant contractors, uh, entities that are providing access to low cost capital, providing support and obtaining businesses and financial services, training, mentorship and support to contractors, um, those who may help obtain help assist with obtaining certifications, matchmaking and collaborative activities, um, those that can help with collaborations with CEDRA programs, other businesses and economic development programs, as well as for data management and reporting. Um, each sub-grantee 
when submitting an application, will need to show an MOU, a memorandum of understanding, or some kind of documentation that shows that the partnership exists and what the subgrantee intends to do through the program. This program does outline some specific staffing requirements for running the contractor incubator program. It, there's a requirement for there to be one full-time program lead at 100% time. And then there should also be key staff that can deliver on the following program elements. These include program administration, outreach and recruitment, business and financial support services, business entrepreneurship training, um, advising and mentorship, and professional and networking support. One or more people can be working to deliver these different program elements. The, uh, the NOFO um, proposal or the proposal that's submitted in response to the NOFO um, should have or include if there is a need to hire for a key position, create a job description so that the proposal reviewers can see where your project is going in terms of the open positions that will be created by, um, by receiving grant funding to carry out the contractor incubator services. Once again, in terms of program delivery, locations, and operations, the facilities need to be ADA compliant and accessible to the target populations. Um, it is a good idea for multiple programs to be co-located at one location. This is strongly encouraged. The facility should have at least a conference room for training, as well as areas for meeting one-on-one -on -one with clients for confidential conversations. Uh, the facility should be open full-time five days a week, excluding weekends and holidays. And special consideration will be given for extended evening and weekend hours that meet the needs of the contractor businesses that are being served. Client files need to be stored um, securely and maintained. Next, we'll go through the application and submission information. First, the applicant must register in the GATA portal. Um, we have Amber Broughton, who's going to go over this more in depth. So I'm just going to move on to the next slide. As part of the grant submission package, the applicant needs to prepare all of the elements that are included on this screen. These materials include the uniform grant application, the uniform budget, including costs for one year using DCEO's template, conflict of interest disclosure, mandatory disclosure, a technical proposal and executive summary, a staffing plan, and a work plan. Pay attention to the application formatting requirements for the submission. So for example, applications must be formatted to an eight and a half by 11 inch page sizing using 11 point font. The executive summary and the technical proposal should be single spaced with one inch margins and all of the pages need to be sequentially numbered. It can take more time than you think to finalize the materials to submit as a full packet. Don't wait until the last minute to make sure that the formatting requirements have been fulfilled. Grant submitted after 5 p.m. Oh, sorry. Uh, this program is an open and rolling basis, receiving the, um, receiving the applications. So the grants, uh, grant applications and proposals will be taken on a rolling basis for this program. Here are just the examples of what the uniform application for state grant assistance looks like, as well as the uniform budget template. So this should be uh, the documents that you are going to look at uh, for submission of the program and make sure that the, uh, especially the budget that you submit is uh, provided in Excel in this template.
The conflict of interest disclosure and mandatory disclosure must also be submitted and they look like these forms. Um, the applicants must submit an executive one page summary as well as a technical proposal. The funding announcement provides direction for what information to include in each section. Each section of the technical proposal must correspond with the application review criteria in part E of the NOFO. The technical proposal narrative will need to include information about the applicant team, capacity and qualifications. The documentation of need section identifies the region where the project operates and describes barriers and economic conditions faced by businesses in target communities. Describe the expected impact of the project on identified target populations, communities, and job growth in clean energy and related trades. The program or project plan described in the technical proposal should correspond with the work plan. Applicants must provide a budget narrative to accompany the uniform grant budget. The budget narrative contains a detailed breakdown of the budget expenses and a justification for their cost. Proposals require a staffing plan and a proposed work plan. These are attachments that are going to be found in the appendix of the NOFO and on the NOFO website. The staffing plan needs to include resumes of key staff and may include job descriptions for any positions that the application team is preparing to hire. MOUs or memorandums of understanding should be submitted with all key partners detailing that entity's information, key staffing information, their roles and responsibilities with the project and any of the dollar amounts for their services to be provided. The MOUs need to be signed by the applicant and the subgrantee. The work plan should be in alignment with the narrative plan in the technical proposal, and that should be in alignment with the staffing plan. It should be feasible and credible that the staffing plan and the proposed work plan that are being proposed um, is all in alignment with the narrative. All outcomes, tasks, deliverables, milestones, and a project timeline should be presented. Do make sure that the final versions of these documents are legible to the merit review team. Make sure that the information printed in each of the text boxes is fully readable and hasn't been cut off either by PDF or Excel. Um, once Excel is converted, for example, to PDF and submitted to DCEO, Basically, what happens is that the Excel um, cells themselves are locked in a PDF. You can't actually see them. So rows and columns cannot be re-expanded in order to read the information that the applicant team carefully crafted. I mentioned that the application review criteria is in Part E of the NOFO. Read the section carefully as it directly relates to information that needs to be organized in the technical proposal. Now, the applications are going to be scored in four key areas. These include applicant team qualifications and uh, capacity, 35%, 15% on documentation of need, 35% on project quality and integration, and 15% on cost effectiveness. The proposals will be sorted by the regional incubator hub location and then scored by the merit review team. And once again, the criteria for which, uh, an expanded criteria for which the proposals would be reviewed is in section E.1 of the NOFO. So to learn more, ask questions and get assistance. Program eligibility requirements and submission information can be found on the NOFO webpage itself and in the NOFO PDF that's provided there. You can submit questions to ceo.eit.cja at illinois.gov. Responses to questions will be made publicly available on the NOFO webpage. 
consider uh, checking out that Q&A uh, document that already exists on the NOFO webpage to see if your question has already been answered before submitting your question to ceo.eit.cj. Um, otherwise, you're likely to hear back that you should check that page for more information. You can also sign up for technical assistance one-on-one. -on -one. Here is the QR code that you can use for technical assistance sign up. And the link to sign up should also be provided in the chat. This would be signing up for 30 minute sessions with a technical assistance provider to answer questions that you have about the NOFO um, and about submitting the NOFO. Here's the timeline. Again, this one is pretty open-ended. We're hosting the information session today. You can sign up for the grants technical assistance um, for half hour blocks with a technical assistance provider. And then the applications are being accepted on a rolling basis. So that is it from me. Once again, if you have any questions, you can email ceo.eit.cja at illinois.gov. And from here, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Amber, who is going to give a GATA training. All right, thanks, Stacey. Share my screen. All right. Okay, go ahead and get started. So uh, thanks for having me. My name is Amber Broughton and I am a technical support manager with the DCEO Office of Accountability. So I'm gonna talk about um, GATA and the GATA grantee portal, pre-qualification and uh, some other requirements um, to keep in mind as a potential grantee. So I'll review the DCEO grant process, how to register in the Illinois GATA grantee portal, Pre-qualification and the elements of that. Uh, notice of funding opportunity, I'll just briefly mention that one. And then what to expect after a grant award. So this is a big picture overview of the uh, grant process for State of Illinois grants and here at DCEO. <clears throat> so I'm going to be talking more about, about the uh, pre-qualification and then application submission. Um, after that, your application is going to be reviewed by a merit review committee. Applicants will receive notice from DCEO whether or not you're receiving the award. You'll, you'll receive some sort of notice. If you um, are awarded uh, this grant, you will move on to a uh, notice of state award or NOSA um, that you will accept in the GATA grantee portal. Then it's time to develop the grant agreement. So this is the legally binding document between you as the grantee and DCEO as the grantor. And it's gonna lay out all um, grant expectations, all grant requirements, um, and then it will be signed by you as the grantee and DCEO leadership. Once the grant agreement is in place and you begin implementing project objectives, you're gonna uh, be assigned a grant manager here at DCEO and you will submit uh, periodic financial reports and periodic performance reports. Um, all of these expectations will be laid out in the grant agreement. Monitoring is needed for adherence to the terms and conditions of the grant agreement. Also wanna note that annual audit reports will be due in the GATA grantee portal. Uh, then it's time for the closeout of the grant. The grant will be closed or possibly extended once the grant period ends. All right, so this term GATA that refers refers to the Grant Accountability and Transparency Act, which the state of Illinois adopted the federal grant guidance and regulations that are codified in 2 CFR Part 200. So we're taking uh, the federal guidance and requirements and adopting them to Illinois grants. <clears throat> then we have the GATA grantee portal. So this is a statewide grant management system. The system is used for grant activity across all agencies. So if you've had a grant with another agency, uh, you're likely familiar with this. If you're brand new to the portal, you're going to need to create an account. So that middle button there says create an account. 
And if you've been in it before, you hit that button that says grantee portal sign in. If you are new to the GATA portal, I highly recommend you check out the GATA new user guide, which we'll put that in the chat. Uh, this is a PDF that provides step-by-step -step instructions for registering in the portal, as well as answering some common questions. Um, I think it's helpful for not only new users, uh, but the manual can be helpful for current users as well. I also recommend checking out gata.illinois.gov. This is um, the website for the Grant Accountability and Transparency Unit at the Governor's Office of Management and Budget. This group is the statewide experts on all things grants and GATA. They have a large amount of information, manuals, and references on several grant subjects. Uh, so if you would like to learn more, recommend checking them out. All right, so I've used this term pre-qualification. Uh, what do we mean when we say pre-qualification? That is uh, the state of Illinois has defined a set of requirements for all organizations seeking to receive grant funding. Entities um, need to be to meet all these requirements and be in good standing. Um, Pre-qualification must first be obtained by the organization, but also that status needs to be maintained um, throughout the life of the grant. Um, and then also if you wish to apply for um, more grants. Pre-qualification status must be met by the close of the grant application in which you are applying. This means that your organization has met all the outlined requirements by the time the grant application is to be reviewed. Here is a screenshot of how your organization's pre-qualification status might look in the GATA grantee portal. The items that are listed in red require action by your entity and needs to be addressed by your entity. So in this case, their SAM.gov account has an issue. Um, the Illinois Secretary of State, it says not found. So those items in red need to be addressed by you as, as the grantee. You can hit the help button just to the right of that red um, box and it will help guide you through how to remediate that issue. The item in yellow is considered pending. It's usually something that is being reviewed and will uh, work itself out within a day or two. So you don't need to worry about those yellow items, just the ones in red. All right, now I'm gonna go through one, on, one by one each of the pre-qualification requirements. SAM.gov account. So you need to have an active registration in the System of Award Management or SAM, SAM.gov. This is a federal site. Um, you need to have an active registration, needs to be validated annually. <clears throat> um, you will receive a UEI number. It's a unique entity identifier. That number um, is generated in SAM.gov and you will use it in the Illinois GATA grantee portal. So you'll need that number. Um, definitely want to point out the difference between receiving the UEI and completing the registration. We have a lot of folks that get that UEI and stop. There are more steps involved in the registration and having a complete registration is a requirement. I also recommend um, that you look to make sure that your registration is set to public. Uh, if it is set to private, then the federal site, SAM.gov, cannot sync properly with the state site, the Illinois uh, grantee portal. So make sure that your registration is set to public. Federal employer ID number or FEIN, uh, you likely already have one of these. Uh, this is provided free of charge from the IRS. Um, nothing that you need to do with this one once you uh, get your FEIN number put into the portal. Um, verification is confirmed automatically from SAM.gov. You cannot be on the federal excluded parties list. Um, if you're on this list, that means that your entity um, is not allowed to receive uh, federal financial assistance or benefits. Um, don't see this one pretty often, um, but if you, if you do see that you're on the, the list, it automatically updates. Uh, you are not eligible for state of Illinois uh, funding. You need to obtain a certificate of good standing from the Illinois Secretary of State. 
Um, this uh, demonstrates that you're in com full compliance with all of their state regulations. Entities can register at the Secretary of State at ilsos.gov. And uh, they have a special section of business resources that can um, help guide you through how to obtain that certificate of good standing. The exception for this would be governmental entities. They are not required to obtain a certificate of good standing. Uh, this is for nonprofits and businesses, that sort of thing. All right, another item um, on the pre-qualification list is you cannot be on the Illinois Stop Payment list. That means that uh, your entity would, has fallen out of compliance um, due to, it's usually uh, a, pa a past grant, um, missing a report, uh, not submitting your audit. Um, there was some sort of reason why uh, your organization was put on the stop payment list. And you can check um, what the reason was in the portal. Uh, if you have any questions um, and how to remediate the issue, you're gonna wanna contact your former grant manager and see what is missing and see what you need to do. You can contact your Cognizant Agency here at DCEO. You can contact ceo.granthelp at illinois.gov, and we will help um, find out what the issue was, what's missing, how you can get in good standing. Um, don't leave this until the last minute because it may um, be something that you know takes, takes a little bit of work to uh, get it resolved. So um, check your pre-qualification status and make sure you're not on that list. You also cannot be on the Illinois Department of Healthcare and Family Services or DHFS sanction list. Um, if, you're, if your organization is on that list, you're not eligible for Medicaid re reimbursement. Uh, this is usually something pretty severe, a violation of an administrative rule, civil law, or criminal offense. Um, so if you do see that your entity is on this list, you are not eligible for state of Illinois grant funding. A couple of tips. Uh, about the portal, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you maintain a current and accurate contact list so that the right people, the right staff at your organization are receiving those notifications. Um, so if you are awarded this grant, you wanna make sure it's going to the right email. Um, you wanna make sure that the right people can access your entity's um, portal page. You also wanna make sure that in the portal, you have the correct fiscal year end date for your organization. Uh, this will come into play when it's time for audits. Notice a funding opportunity or NOFO. Uh, Stacy went over um, many of these items. This is the document that contains all of the information for this particular grant. And so it goes um, in order of program description, funding information, who is eligible to apply, how to apply, um, what the reviewers will be looking for. So this is the document that you wanna know um, front to back. So make sure that um, you are reading this carefully. If you are interested in other NOFOs, they can be found um, on our DCEO website or in the catalog of state financial assistance. All right, this is the DCEO website, the apply for funding uh, page. Got the, um, the link on the screen and in the chat. So this first arrow here, it says apply for funding. Then you scroll down to the uh, the opportunity that you're interested in. And then you'll come to um, the screenshot on the right that has um, a quick summary of the important documents, um, the important dates that you need to know, the, you know, how much funding, all that good stuff. And then you go down to the application documents, that first one that says NOFO supplement, that is the NOFO. So that is the one that you want to pay attention to. Um, I'll quickly go over the internal controls questionnaire, ICQ. This is a um, short assessment that you need to complete in the GATA grantee portal. It is used by all state agencies. Um, just wanna make sure that you complete that every state fiscal year. It's used to mitigate risk and build grantee capacity. It's not punitive it will not determine whether or not you receive funding. All right, just wanna emphasize these post-award requirements. 
all of these requirements are going to be laid out for you in the grant agreement. So no surprises. You're going to know exactly when things are due and um, and who they go to. It's usually your grant manager unless you're told otherwise. So you'll be submitting periodic financial reports and periodic performance reports. Also want to note that all grantees are required to submit a consolidated year-end financial statement and audit. Um, the type of audit that is needed for uh, your, your entity will be determined by um, a questionnaire called a certification form in the GATA grantee portal. Please keep in mind that there will likely be a cost associated with an audit and the grantee is responsible for those expenses. So you will be responsible for um, the expenses and finding the auditor too. So that is, that's something to keep in mind um, when you are applying. Like I said, the type of audit uh, will be determined in the GATA grantee portal. You'll fill out a short questionnaire and it will tell you what sort of audit is needed. Uh, this table here just goes over the different types of audits just as a reference. Okay, the DCEO grantee resource site. Uh, we have lots of resources available to you as a grantee and an applicant. We have um, learning video learning libraries. So we have um, short video tutorials on many of the grant subjects that I've talked about today. If you want um, to kind of take a deeper dive into that. I also recommend signing up for our training and office hours invitation list. So we have um, monthly pre-qualification trainings. We also have monthly trainings on revolving topics um, on, on many of the grant subjects that I've talked about today and more. So uh, please sign up for that invitation list. Our Office of Accountability also has office hours. They're virtual every Tuesday from two to three. You can also email us at ceo.granthelp at illinois.gov. All right. Thank you. I will pass it back over to Steve. Okay, thank you so much, Amber, for that information about GATA. Um, we set this meeting for about one hour today, and we are right up on time. 